Hi, everybody. Um, I think we can get started. We've got a, a good group of participants here and we'll um, let anyone else who comes in a bit later join as they come. My name is Laura and I am the Two Rivers Marshal who will be facilitating the creatures of the Arbutin Creek Quebec crew today. We would like to start this event by acknowledging that the city of Guelph, where the Two Rivers Festival takes place, is situated within the Dish with One Spoon Treaty lands between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Here in these river valleys, we have learned that the Attawandaran or neutral peoples were also among the original stewards. We'd like to recognize the enduring presence of Aboriginal peoples on this land and the history of the First Nations peoples and neighboring First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. Today, there are a wide number of Indigenous peoples who call this territory home under the Haldeman Tract Treaty with the Mississaugas of New Credit. We want to express solidarity with the 88 First Nations communities in Ontario currently under drinking water advisories. And I'd like to welcome you to Creatures of the Arboretum Creek. This event is part of the 10th annual Two Rivers Festival that celebrates and appreciates the Speed and Aramasa Rivers. The theme of this year's festival is the confluence of rivers, peoples, and their stories. We'd like to extend our hearty thanks to the Arboretum at the University of Guelph and Michelle for sharing their passion for the rivers with us and thanks to all of you for attending the event. The festival is organized and run by volunteers and involves many community organizations. Please support these organizations that are doing good work in our community and our advertisers and our event sponsors, CFRU, Mike Schreiner and Nikki Shepard who made this event possible. You can see all our advertisers on our website. I've posted the link in the chat. We have, we've had over 40 great events this year and there's still a few weeks left of the festival to catch some more. So please have a look and RSVP to the other events which are of interest to you. The festival is a project of the Wellington Water Watchers and it is our hope that if we all celebrate and fall in love with our rivers, we will want to further protect them. So just a few housekeeping things for this event. We will be recording these events to share and if you do not feel comfortable with that, please know that you can turn off your video. Um, please make sure to keep your microphone muted during the event to minimize background noise for our speaker. And um, throughout the event, if we've got some, Michelle's going to have some questions for you and we can pop your answers in the chat or also since we're a small group, I think we can um, unmute or use raise hand to answer questions as well. Please remember to keep our event space inclusive, kind and respectful. If you wish, you can change your name to include your pronouns. And with that, I will introduce our host for this evening. Michelle Beltran is a recent graduate from the University of Guelph with a Bachelor's of Science majoring in Biological Science and minoring in Zoology. After graduating, Michelle started working at the University of Guelph Arboretum as a summer naturalist. In her personal life, Michelle enjoys exploring Guelph's natural areas and she is an avid bird watcher, herper and all around nature enthusiast. Very excited to have her with us this evening to share her knowledge and passion and I will pass it over to you, Michelle. Awesome, thank you, Laura, for such an awesome introduction. I'm gonna share my screen so you guys just let me know if you can see and if it's working well. So like Laura said, my name is Michelle and I'm from the University of Guelph Arboretum. And for any of you who maybe aren't familiar with the Arboretum, maybe you haven't had a chance to visit us, what an arboretum is, is essentially a museum for trees. So if you can think about, if you ever go to an art museum, you can find artwork from different places of the world, different types of art, different collections. And it's the same idea with an arboretum. So if you were to visit the University of Guelph Arboretum, you could find trees that are local to Guelph, that are native to Ontario. But you can also find trees that are native to places all around in Canada and even trees that would be found across the world. We also have a lot of involvement in research projects since we are part of the university. And there's also some conservation work that happens through the University of Guelph Arboretum. A lot of times when people think of an endangered species, you automatically think of something exotic and an animal. So a lot of people would think of a panda or a rhino, and those are excellent examples of endangered species, but trees can also need some conservation work. They can also go in danger and need some of our help. And so the University of Guelph is part of various gene banks for trees that are um, at risk. And then uh, to further introduce myself, like Laura said, I am a summer naturalist. And to be a naturalist, what that basically means is my job is to help connect people like yourselves with nature. And that 
really excites me because I love sharing and teaching people all about how amazing our world is. Before I jump into our presentation, I do want to give a big thank you to all the photographers that I've used uh, pictures from in this presentation. A lot of the pictures are from Chris Early, the interpretive biologist at the Arboretum, but some of the pictures also did come from the Flickr's Creative Commons, so a big thank you to them. And before we dive deep into the creatures and the plants that are found in a creek or in a water system, let's take a moment to think about different habitat types. Whether they're aquatic like ponds, rivers, lakes and oceans, or they're terrestrial like a forest or grassland or mountains, all these different habitat types have different conditions. And they also create different niches for the plants and animals that reside in them. And what a niche is, is basically it encompasses a lot of things. So it includes the function and role that organism is going to play in the ecosystem they live. But it also includes things like the resources that organism needs to survive. So the food and the habitat or the shelter that that organism needs. So within any habitat that we explore, whether it's aquatic or terrestrial, we can take a moment to consider the different conditions that that specific habitat has, and maybe the different niches that are available for different organisms. But of course, regardless of the habitat that you're talking about, be it aquatic or terrestrial, no habitat is isolated. And so in the case of aquatic systems, there is something called a riparian zone, which is basically the transitional area between aquatic to terrestrial habitats. Can anyone think of, and I invite you to put this in the chat and participate, um, can anyone think of what you might find in a transitional area between water and land? So I'm not seeing any guesses just yet from the chat? Maybe you guys are just still giving it a bit of time to think. But we can consider what is different about the transitional area between aquatic and terrestrial habitats. So maybe there's a lot more water between these transitional habitats. And what that means is now a limiting resource for a lot of different habitats is water. Water is an incredibly important resource because plants needed to grow, animals needed to survive. It's needed by everything. So in this riparian zone, in this transitional area between aquatic and terrestrial habitats, there is more water. And that allows for different plants to grow. And maybe more amounts of plants. There's a bigger diversity of plants that you can find in this area. And more diversity in plants leads to more diversity in animals because Plants create shelter and habitat, food and other resources for other plants, for other animals. So in this transitional area between aquatic and terrestrial habitats, you can find a lot of biodiversity. And that's not just unique to transitions between aquatic to terrestrial habitats. The edge, the natural edge between any two ecosystems, any two habitats, is usually a place of great biodiversity because all of a sudden you have the conditions and the resources from one habitat and the conditions and the resources from a different habitat and they meet in the edge and now certain animals and plants can take advantage of resources that can be found in both habitats along that edge. So the edge of any ecosystem of any habitat is usually very diverse and in the case of transitions between aquatic to terrestrial habitats, they're very diverse because of the abundance of water. And at the Arboretum, there are a few aquatic habitats that we have. And so I'm going to go through a couple of examples of aquatic habitats that you can find in the Arboretum so we can consider the different conditions that can be found in different aquatic habitats. So this is a picture of Victoria Woods and it's a pond, it's the pond found in Victoria Woods. And what makes ponds a little bit different from other aquatic systems, if you think of a lake, well, a lake is much deeper, it uh, has more movement sometimes, whereas a pond is small and that allows it to be warmer because the sun's able to warm up more of the water. It is uh, often less oxygenated because when water moves, like let's say in a creek, 
as the water moves through that creek and it flows, not only does it cool down, but it also aerates. More oxygen is entered into the water system. And so in a pond where the water is standing, it is often warmer and less oxygenated. And it, because it's not as deep, there's more photic zones, which means sunlight is able to reach more area of a pond. And sunlight's really important for plants because they need sunlight to photosynthesize. So all these different conditions are found in a pond. Certain organisms might prefer the so still standing water of a pond as opposed to the flowing river uh, movement in a river. This aquatic system is similar to the pond that I just showed you. This is the boardwalk in Wild Goose Woods, and it's something called an ephemeral pond. Ephemeral just means for a short time. So this pond is temporary. And I took the pictures in this slide maybe about just over a week ago. And I haven't checked on it since yesterday's rain, but last time I looked at it on Monday, there was just about no more water left in uh, Wild Goose Woods. And that's because this is an ephemeral pond. It dries up. We usually expect this pond to dry up later in the summer. But of course, this year we've had quite a dry spring. So it's drying up a bit early. But just because it's a temporary pond doesn't mean that it isn't impactful for the rest of the habitat around it. Uh, animals are able to still use ephemeral ponds in their reproduction. So many insects will reproduce in ephemeral ponds. And you may be thinking, what happens to any of the animals that live in an ephemeral pond once it dries up? That's their home. That's their habitat. Um, how can they survive after an ephemeral pond has dried up? Well, there's a few scenarios that could happen. If you can think of something like a frog, a frog uses aquatic habitats for only part of its life. So it lays its eggs in water and the eggs will hatch out into tadpoles. And those tadpoles are aquatic animals and will eventually grow up to frogs, which are terrestrial animals. So frogs are able to make use of ephemeral ponds because they only need the water for part of their uh, life cycle, along with many other insects that will transition from aquatic nymphs to terrestrial insects. For the case of other animals, though, some invertebrates will go through their entire life cycle in the time that that ephemeral pond is present and die before that ephemeral pond dries up. So the eggs will hatch out from in the water and those immature uh, animals will grow up, mature, reproduce, lay their eggs, die. And when that water dries up, those eggs will remain dormant in the soil. Now, the following year, after all the snow melts and we get our usual spring showers and this ephemeral pond comes back, those, those eggs are still surviving. They're, they've just gone dormant for that dry period and they're able to hatch out and the entire cycle starts again. And ephemeral ponds aren't necessarily a disadvantage to the animals that choose or need to use them. Just because it's temporary doesn't mean it's not just as good as other aquatic systems. There's actually a really big benefit to using ephemeral ponds. And that is that it's temporary. And that means not every animal can use it. Animals like fish need aquatic systems all the time. So fish can't live in ephemeral ponds. And fish are a big predator for invertebrates and for tadpoles and for other animals that choose to use ephemeral ponds. So just because it's a short temporary pond doesn't mean it's not any good. It actually provides some of the animals with a pretty big benefit of having fewer predators. And the last system, I'll, the last habitat I'll go through is the, the creek that runs through the Arboretum. Here's a little video of what it looks like. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like much of a creek right now because it's quite dried up. But I do promise you when there is water in that creek, it, it does look like a creek. Right now, it just kind of looks like a sad puddle, unfortunately. It's been quite a dry uh, spring. So this is the creek that runs through the Arboretum. And this creek actually flows into Aramosa River, which flows into the Speed River, which flows into the Grand River watershed. 
And a watershed is basically a place on land where different water systems drain into. So rivers and streams and rain and snow melts will all drain into a watershed. And in the case of the Grand River watershed, it's actually the biggest in southern Ontario. It's home to 80 species at risk and hundreds of native flora and fauna. So it's an incredibly important water system. And that leads me into ooh, my next point, which is why are aquatic systems so important? And we could really sit here all night and discuss the various reasons why aquatic systems are so, so important. And I have a picture up of a little porcupine and you might be thinking this is the wrong picture. This little porcupine has nothing to do with aquatic systems. It's not an aquatic animal, but it does rely on healthy aquatic systems. Everything relies on healthy water. And so in the case of a watershed, a healthy functioning watershed provides us with many benefits. It's able to filter out pollutants and toxins through the many plants and organisms that live in those water systems. They help to uh, filter out those toxins. Uh, healthy water systems are able to reduce and prevent the chances of flooding. They act as a reservoir for water, which many animals require. Things fish like we talked about earlier they need water year round um, some animals use water temporarily like frogs and other amphibians and in the case of insects many insects reproduce in water and i know insects often get a bad rap not everyone really loves insects but they're so important insects fill so many different roles in different ecosystems some insects are pollinators so they help plants to reduce. Some are, car are uh, carnivores, so they help control populations of other animals. And some are detrivores, which means they help break down organic matter. So insects are incredibly important, and they have so many vital functions for ecosystems. Without insects, everything would really fall apart. So water systems are really important because they're a site where many insects reproduce. The, and the endless reasons why uh, water systems are so important really ties it back to that picture. This porcupine has nothing to do with water systems, uh, but they still benefit from healthy water systems. Areas uh, with healthy water systems, like the Ripper and Zone, for example, is a huge source of biodiversity. And biodiversity is important for a lot of reasons. One of them being, if something happens to a habitat, to an ecosystem, be it natural or um, unnatural, it, they're able to come back more easily if it's a very biodiverse system. So one local example I can think of is Dutch elm disease. So if anyone isn't familiar with Dutch elm disease, it's a disease that is invasive to Canada. And when it got brought over to Ontario, we saw a lot of our elm trees really struggle. A lot of them died. They weren't uh, equipped to survive Dutch elm disease. And it was, it's, a, it's a tough loss for the forest systems that have elm, elm trees in them. But could you imagine how much worse a disease like Dutch elm disease would be if our forest only had elm disease? If we didn't have, if our forest only had elm trees, if we didn't have a diverse uh, diversity in the tree species that we have, if we only have one species of trees and a disease hits it, there goes our forest. So biodiversity is important because it helps uh, ecosystems be more resilient. Some plants and organisms might be more resilient to a drought. And so that means if certain plants and animals are hit hard by a dry year, it's not a loss for the entire ecosystem. So biodiversity is really important and aquatic systems are often a source of a lot of biodiversity. Now that we've given ourselves a bit of background knowledge on water systems, let's talk about some of the plants that you might find in aquatic habitats. And one of my favorite spring flowers is marsh marigold. That's what I have pictured here. Unfortunately, a little bit too cropped in, but marsh marigolds are one of the first blossoming flowers in spring. They're one of the first signs of springs, really, and they're beautiful, cheery yellow flowers. 
are kind of just the pick me up every Canadian needs after our long cold winters. And not only is this flower really beautiful, but they also have a lot of functions in their ecosystems. So they provide nectar for pollinators as one of the first uh, flowering fl flowering flowers in spring. They're an important source of nectars for a lot of insects. And even when they're out of bloom, their big broad leaves provide habitat for other animals. So they make excellent frog habitat. And this is a flower that you can often find growing in moist or damp soil. Cattails are probably a really familiar plant for for really anyone who hangs out near water. Um, this is a plant that grows often in wet conditions and their roots are very strong and that helps prevent soil erosion. So soil, um, if it's not anchored down by plants or other organisms, it can easily erode into the water systems. And erosion can be uh, damaging to water systems at times if it happens and too great of a quantity because the top layer of soil is the most nutrient rich. And so natural erosion helps transfer uh, nutrients through water systems to different plants, but too much erosion or runoff of fertilizer can actually be harmful for water systems. And cattails have very strong roots that help prevent soil erosion. This next plant, is a bald cypress tree. And they're very recognizable by those little bumps that you see growing out of the ground. Those little, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but these little bumps, they look like little stumps. Those are called bald cypress knees. And that's kind of a funny word to use. No one actually knows why the bald cypress grows those little knees, what functions they provide the tree. But what's special about bald cypress trees is that they're able to grow in very wet soil. Now, it's tricky because water is such an important resource for any plant, but there's always, there always has to be a balance to things. So not enough water isn't good, but too much water can also be bad for a plant. Anyone who has indoor plants probably knows the struggle of under or over watering your plants. And it's the same for trees. So the top layer of soil, that's where a lot of nutrients are found, and that's really important for the plants. But a little bit deeper and really throughout the soil, there's little pockets of air. And the roots of a plant need those pockets of air uh, to survive. And in really wet, damp soil, oftentimes those pockets of air disappear. And that soil becomes very low in oxygen. It becomes hypoxic. And so many trees, many plants aren't able to actually survive in very, very damp water, uh, very damp soil, because of this, the soil becomes too hypoxic uh, with all the water in there. But bald cypress trees are special because their stems and roots are adapted to be able to pull oxygen out of these lower oxygen soils so they can still survive and thrive. So a bald cypress tree is an excellent example of a plant that is really well adapted to live in very wet conditions. This is a white willow, and it's another example of a tree that really loves to grow in more moist soil. It doesn't have all the adaptations that the bald cypress tree has, uh, but it's an example of a tree that really enjoys um, wetter conditions. And all of these plants, are really important because plants often provide a very foundational uh, basis to any ecosystem. Plants provide food, shelter, habitat resources for all of the animals uh, that want to inhabit an ecosystem. And really up until now and throughout this presentation, you probably heard me say, this one thing is really, really important. And then another slide will come and I'll say, this other thing is also so, so important. And it's not because I'm super excited and it's not because I'm over-exaggerating. It's because everything in an ecosystem has its own role and fun function. It kind of goes back to that niche it has. And so even the smallest insignificant thing that you come across in an ecosystem, if it's natural, if it's native, it's there to do a job. And so the plants have a very important job of creating food for different animals, for creating shelter and habitat. So they're super important. And animals like insects have their own job and they're really important. 
So throughout this presentation and probably up until now, you've heard me say all these things are super important. And you know, I'm not trying to pull your attention in too many different directions. Um, really, at the end of the day, everything is important, which is kind of overwhelming to think of. And now that we've talked about some of the plants that live in aquatic systems or near aquatic systems, let's talk about the critters that inhabit in aquatic systems. And before we dive into the different IDs and the different types of critters you can find in aquatic systems, I want us to take a moment to think about what conditions do aquatic habitats pose on animals? And maybe what kind of adaptations do those animals need to have to survive any challenges aquatic habitats pose on them? So an adaptation is a way an organism responds to factors in its environment. And in the case of this little toad here, it's an example of a terrestrial adaptation. Because life on land brings one really big challenge. It brings a lot of challenges. But the one I'm focusing on right now is that it's dry. So all animals need water. And when you're on land, there's less water around you. So there's a risk that you just dry up. And the way this little toad has adapted to terrestrial life is it has more keratinized skin cells. And that allows it to keep water in its body. It prevents it from drying out. So we can take a moment. And you guys are, again, welcome to write in the chat. Maybe unmute yourself if that's easier for you. What challenges do aquatic systems pose for animals? And what type of adaptations do you think they might have to overcome those challenges? I'll maybe get the ball rolling with one example of a challenge to living in an aquatic system. And that would be how you take in oxygen. So water is a really important thing that many organisms need, really all organisms need, but oxygen is also really important. So some, uh, some animals that live in aquatic systems and aquatic habitats um, might use gills to uh, respirate. Uh, some might breathe air, but still live in the water. So there's different ways an animal can overcome that type of challenge. Another challenge to uh, aquatic life might be how you move around. So if you think of a fish, they've overcome that challenge by having fins. That's their way to move around. In the case of... Um, other insects, they might use different appendages to move themselves around in the water. And what I'm really getting at with all these things and having you guys consider the challenges and adaptations that different animals might have uh, for living in aquatic systems is to help you um, consider different ways of remembering IDs for these animals. So the critters that live in aquatic systems a lot of them are invertebrates. A lot of them are insects. And personally, I don't know about you guys, maybe you guys are all really big insect and invertebrate pros. I find learning and familiarizing myself with such a diverse group of animals like insects really challenging because there's so many. And some of them will look different at different points in their lifetime. And some of them will look really similar to each other. And so, Overall, I can find it sometimes a little bit challenging to familiarize myself with such a large group of animals. But if I consider the different adaptations that those animals might have, the things that maybe that make that animal a little bit special, I can help myself remember the different animals that are, are uh, how to tell apart different invertebrates and different insects. So that's the strategy I use uh, when I try to familiarize myself with uh, insects. And hopefully it's uh, a trick that might help you guys as well. So one commonly found uh, aquatic uh, pond uh, insect is this little bloodworm. And bloodworms are an excellent example of an animal that will look really different at different points of its life. 
So this is the larva of the of midges, which are uh, flying insects. So they're not going to look anything like this as adults. Uh, but luckily, in their larval form, I find them pretty easy to identify because of their bright red coloring. And this here is one of my favorite invertebrates to find in a pond, and it's a water strider. So these guys, I find really easy to ID because of the adaptations they have evolved to move around on water. So they use their very, very long legs you can see here and the surface tension of the top of the water to skate around and move across the top of the water. And because they're using the surface tension of the water to move around, they don't want to sink um, or really get too wet because that would hinder their movement. Uh, they, these guys actually prefer more still water. They don't really prefer uh, aquatic systems like creeks or rivers that move around a lot. You can find these guys a lot of the times in ponds. So the water strider, I like to remember them by those really big, long legs. Those legs actually have hydro hydrophobic properties, which basically means water-hating properties to keep it dry. And they use the surface tension and their ability to distribute their weight so broadly across their legs and the top of the water uh, to skate around. This next uh, invertebrate looks like just a piece of sticks and stones, and that's exactly what it's trying to do. So here in the middle, we have a caddisfly larva. And you can't actually see the, the critter too well. And that's because it's hidden deep inside of its case. So caddisfly larvae have this amazing ability to spin silk from their mouth. And they will grab sticks and stones and mud and other organic matter. And they will spin it together with the silk to create this case. And so this is an adaptation to keep itself protected from predators. And so sometimes when you uh, catch a caddisfly larva, or if you're looking at it, you can sometimes see it come out and pop out of its case and move around on the bottom of uh, the water. So these guys, pretty cool. And I can remember them pretty easily because nothing really looks uh, like a mismatch of uh, different organic matter. Different caddisfly larva species will actually build their cases out of different materials. So this caddisfly larva has chosen to build its case out of uh, various sticks, it looks like. And this next uh, critter, some of you might be very familiar with, it's a leech. And leeches often are not very popular. Uh, people often hate on leeches, but they're honestly very, very cool. They're a very diverse group of animals. And leeches uh, partake in parasitism a lot of the time. And that is a relationship where one individual, the parasite, benefits and the other individual uh, doesn't benefit at all. And so what leeches will do is they have sucking uh, mouth parts that will latch onto their host. And their host can be really anything from another leech to uh, a mammal. And they actually have an anesthetic that they can inject into their host before they bite and break the skin. So oftentimes, if you get a leech, you won't even feel that the leech has been into you because it has that handy anesthetic. So you know what, for a parasite, I think they're being pretty polite and making the experience painless for their host. This next uh, critter you guys are probably very familiar with, it's a snail. And so snails use that hard shell to protect its soft body. So when frightened, I'm sure you've all seen it, snails can pull into their shell and hide away from whatever scary thing is uh, around them. And snails are awesome to see because these guys help keep water clean. They eat algae and other organic debris. And so they help keep the water from being very muggy and dirty. This next species, you guys are probably very familiar with uh, its life stage on the right, but maybe not too familiar with its life stage on the left. So these two pictures are the same uh, insect. It's a dragonfly. And what you see on the left is the dragonfly nymph. 
And on the right, it's the adult dragonfly. And so as nymphs, the way li uh, life cycles work for dragonflies is they lay their eggs in the water. The, the eggs hatch out into little nymphs like you see on the left and they grow up through molting. And so after oh so many molts, that dragonfly uh, nymph will step out of the water, molt one last time into a beautiful dragonfly. And then they mate and reproduce and the cycle starts all over again in the water. So dragonflies are an awesome example of how different animals rely on aquatic systems for their life cycles. Uh, in the case of many insects, it's for reproduction. And so without healthy water systems, um, they wouldn't be able to reproduce and we wouldn't have quite as many insects. And that would be very bad for really all the ecosystems. But what's really cool about dragonflies is that at any point in their life cycle, these guys are lean, mean hunting machines. So it might not look like the little uh, nymph on the left can really do much, but these guys actually have a specialized jaw. And the way it works is they'll pump water into their mouth to kind of build up the pressure. And their jaw is hyper flexible. So they'll shoot their jaw out and catch uh, other invertebrates in the water. And in the case for some of the bigger dragonflies, on your left, you see a darner nymph. And darners are one of the bigger groups of dragonflies. Darner nymphs are actually able to catch a small fish. So that is absolutely mind blowing to think of an invertebrate being able to catch a vertebrate, um, pretty impressive stuff. And as adults, adult dragonflies are also perfectly designed to be predators. They have those big, huge eyes. And what's really special about dragonfly eyes is that they offer them an almost 360 degree view of the world. So if we think of ourselves, we have a very limited view of the world. At a certain point, our periphery cuts out and we get a huge blind spot. So really all of this behind me, I can't see my hands waving. I have a huge blind spot. But dragonflies, on the other hand, uh, their eyes are really special because they offer an almost 360 view of the world. And that's helpful for not only predator avoidance, but also for prey detection. Dragonflies are also incredibly fast. If anyone has seen them flying, which I'm sure we all have, you see just how fast these guys are able to go. And even their arms are adapted to be predators. Because they're using their wings to fly around, their arms all hang down in front of them and they kind of form a little basket. So they're not using their arms and legs to, to move or walk around. They're using their, their wings for that. Instead, they form little baskets with their arms uh, to catch bugs out of the air. So it would be really inefficient for a dragonfly to kind of swing its hands individually to try to catch uh, other flying insects. So instead it makes this little basket and it's able to use that to catch other insects straight out of the air. And at different points in its life cycle, it's adapted to the habitat it needs to live in. So aquatic dragonfly nymphs, they will breathe using gills found in their rectum and they move around using those legs. And adult dragonflies, they are able to breathe using spiracles, which are little holes found along the body of the dragonfly. And they move around with their wings, of course. So at different points of its life cycle, this dragonfly is adapted to live in the habitat it, it's living in, which is pretty amazing. Frogs, we've touched on for a little bit. And I love frogs. I love finding frogs uh, when I'm out and about. So on the left, you see a little tadpole. And it's so incredibly impressive to consider this tadpole is going to grow up and look something like the frog on your on your right. It's not the same species. The tadpole and the, and the frog aren't the same species. So it won't grow up to look exactly like that frog. But it will be a frog. And that's amazing to think of the changes that little toad has to undergo to look anything like its parents. And it seems a bit odd to have half of your life be aquatic and half of your life be terrestrial because it must take up a lot of work for your body to change so much. This uh, little tadpole has a tail that's excellent for swimming. It has gills, it's, it's built to live in the water and it has to go through all of these changes to be able to survive on land like its parents do. 
but there's actually some pretty important benefits that come from having that type of life cycle where the, you live in completely different habitats at different points in your life. And one of them is the parents don't ever have to really compete for resources uh, against their own children. So tadpoles are omnivorous. They, they will eat some uh, other invertebrates that swim around in the water, but they also eat uh, plants. And frogs, they are carnivores. So they're interested in eating insects and other animals. And so that's one way the two never really have to compete with each other. They, they're never looking to hunt the same food. They also live in different parts of the water. So frogs still need to live uh, close or close to the water. Their, their legs are, their back legs are webbed. So they're still built for semi-aquatic terrestrial life, uh, but they don't have, they don't occupy the exact same shelter and habitat that the tadpoles need. So they aren't competing for a lot of the same resources, which is a benefit to both uh, the adult and the tadpole. These two pictures are of the same species and we are all very familiar with the adult. These are uh, mosquitoes. So on your left, you see a mosquito larva, and on the right, you see a mosquito pupa. And the pupa is basically, a you can kind of think of it as a butterfly in a cocoon. So it's in, while it's in the, in the pupa life stage, it's a metamorphosizing into the adult form of a mosquito that we're all, maybe some of us too familiar with, um, and so in that life stage, it's not eating, it's uh, just metamorphosizing. And when it's ready to come out of its pupa, the adult will split open the case, make its way on land and dry and uh, become an adult in, uh, mosquito. And mosquitoes get quite the bad rap. No one seems to like mosquitoes. Uh, I'd be lying if I said that I'm their biggest fan. I react a lot to mosquito bites. But even though they are a bit annoying, they provide ecosystems with an incredible source of food. Just about anything and everything will eat a mosquito. So if we got rid of all the mosquitoes, uh, we, we wouldn't be itchy, of course. Yeah, that would be one big benefit. But it would come at a tremendous loss for all of the other animals that need to or rely on mosquitoes as a food source. So as much as maybe uh, you may not like them because they bite you and then you get itchy and, and it's it's not great. Uh, we can appreciate them for how important they are for ecosystems as a food source for many different other animals. It's actually not easy being a mosquito when you think about it. Everything and anything will eat you. Um, so it's a bit tricky for them, I guess. Uh, even if they're not very popular, uh, I think we can all still appreciate how important they are for ecosystems. Speaking of, Something that would love to eat a mosquito uh, are these little uh, beetles. And so on your left, you have a water tiger. And on your right, you have a predaceous diving beetle. So the water tiger is the immature form, the larval form of a predaceous diving beetle. And what I think is really neat about the two uh, life stages, or really all the life stages of a predaceous diving beetle, is that they're not fully uh, equipped to breathe underwater. So even though the larval is restricted to living in water, it actually breathes air and it'll store air in its trachea so it can go down underneath the water and hunt and live and, and do its own water tiger stuff. And the adult will actually use the underside of its wings to stuff air bubbles in it. And so it is able to still breathe air while being underneath water. These guys can dive and remain underneath the water for a very long time, uh, but they don't have gills or, or any other mechanism to, to breathe uh, through the water. Instead, they have other adaptations that allow them to uh, still get oxygen. And predaceous diving beetles and the water tigers both uh, are predators to mosquitoes and other uh, different invertebrates. This next critter is probably very familiar for many people. It's a crayfish, a little mini lobster, as some people call them. And these guys are really cool because they molt, they grow in molt. So each time they molt, they grow a little bit. And when they're freshly molted, their outside is, is 
pretty soft and it'll start to harden uh, after a little bit of time. And what's really fun, if you watch these guys move around underneath the water, they will walk forward, but if they get scared, they actually swim backwards, uh, which is kind of funny to see. And crayfish are a very diverse group of animals. Uh, you can find them all across the world. They're very specious, um, so they're very awesome to see uh, out and about. This next critter is a water boat, is a water boatman. And uh, what's really awesome about water boatmen is uh, their long oar-like legs. It's kind of what they get their name after. This is an adaptation to move around in the water. And it's how I remember them is uh, those long, long oar-like limbs. And they actually have little front uh, uh, arms and legs that are actually used to attach themselves onto vegetation. Because you can imagine being a little invertebrate in a big body of water, uh, they can get moved around quite easily uh, as the water moves around. So they actually will clasp onto vegetation using their front arms and legs. Um, and so their legs are really what helps me identify them. They're really long legs and they also have really short ones at the front to uh, attach themselves. This. Uh, insect is actually vegetarian. So, so far I've given you guys a lot of examples of carnivorous uh, invertebrates and I've gone through some really cool adaptations that those guys have to catch prey, uh, but water bowmen are actually vegetarian. So they're uh, a little bit special to the presentation. I haven't gone through many uh, vegetarian animals. And of course, I've gone through a lot of examples of invertebrates, uh, but there's so many things that use aquatic systems like birds, I am a huge bird fan. I love birding. I think all the critters I've gone through are super exciting and neat and cool, uh, but I also really love birds. And so many birds make use of aquatic systems, uh, ducks, geese. Um, some will hunt fish in different water systems uh, or they'll eat snails or other invertebrates. Um, and then there's also many mammals that maybe don't live directly in the water, uh, but they will use the riparian zone, the transitional area between aquatic and terrestrial habitats. So this little mink is an excellent example of a mammal that likes to live near water. Minks will often hunt uh, fish and other uh, critters that can be found near or in the water. And so it's one example of a mammal you might find if you're near an aquatic habitat. And of course, many reptiles make use of aquatic systems. Turtles are one of my favorite animals. Uh, I love turtles, they're so cute. This is a little midland painted turtle that you can see trying to get itself up to bask on a log. And turtles, uh, many are omnivorous and some will actually eat dead animals. They'll eat carrion. And that's a really important role and function for an animal to have in an aquatic system. Because if you can think of in a lake, a fish dies, many fish dies every, die every day. That's, that's nothing new, that's not surprising. But what do you think happens to that fish when it dies? A lot of animals are picky in the sense that they only wanna eat fresh, still alive animals. That mink, for example, would primarily be going after uh, fresh fish. You know, they're, they're gonna kill their own, their own meal. Uh, but some turtles, including the Midland Painted Turtle, have no problem eating uh, dead, animals. And that sounds gross and yucky and like not very uh, popular to do, but it's incredibly important because if nothing ate those dead fish, think of all the fish that might die in the lake every single day, and those dead fish just sat in that water, it's going to end up polluting and ruining that entire aquatic system. So turtles are incredibly important because many of them will eat um, the nasty stuff that we don't want in our waters. Uh, without many turtles, aquatic systems would, would go bad, really, uh, because they're eating uh, the dead animals that are found in aquatic systems. They also uh, make use of aquatic habitats for hibernation. So turtles will mostly live in water, at least the ones that we have here in Ontario. They come out of their aquatic habitats right now in the spring and in the fall. In the spring, they're, they're leaving their homes in, in aquatic habitats to go lay their eggs. Uh, 
So kind of a, a PSA for any of you guys out there that are driving, uh, keep your eyes out for turtles on the road because they're exiting the ponds, rivers, streams, lakes that they usually leave it, live in. And those habitats are, are very safe for turtles. They have very few natural predators, especially as adults that can uh, kill a turtle. These guys are, are really designed to protect themselves, having that big, huge, hard shell on the top and bottom. Not many animals uh, will kill a healthy adult turtle, but they are very vulnerable on land to cars, unfortunately. So as they leave their water systems and make the trek out, uh, right now you will primarily encounter female turtles who are leaving to go uh, lay their eggs. So as they trek it out of the safety of their aquatic homes, they're very vulnerable to roads uh, and cars unfortunately. So keep your eyes peeled. If you're able to safely do so, help a turtle cross a road. It's uh, quite the awesome thing you can do to help out uh, many turtles, really all the turtles in Ontario are species at risk. So a really special thing you can do if you happen to catch one uh, moving across the road. Now I've given you guys a lot of examples of different critters that you might find in ponds and aquatic systems. Oh. Um, but let's talk about now uh, how you can encounter them. So you can do a little pond study, which is what I have laid out for you guys in this picture. And a pond study is basically uh, an investigation of the critters in that water. And so to do so, I believe you can probably do it really in any public uh, water system, any pond or, or stream that you happen to come across on public land uh, is you just you can use a bucket like I have pictured. Uh, usually you want one with a solid colored uh, bottom like white or or red if you're able to get a red bucket is provide some nice contrast. And you want a little dip net, maybe some vials if you have smaller specimens you want to take a closer look at. And an ID sheet is usually very helpful. Uh, the University of Guelph we produce um, biodiversity sheets on a variety of different topics. So there's actually one on pond lives. And it's just a handy resource to help you ID uh, the various critters that you could potentially find uh, in a pond. And so it doesn't really take a lot of materials, but it's a lot of fun in my opinion. I love doing pond studies uh, to kind of investigate what critters are living in a pond. And there are a couple ground rules that you want to follow before you go out and you conduct your pond study. The first one is be very respectful of the aquatic system and the environment that you are entering. So this is an awesome little activity you can do to appreciate water systems. And the last thing you want to do is accidentally harm a water system. So always pack out what you packed in. You know, if you brought eight little vials, leave with your eight little vials. Don't leave any litter or, or materials. Uh, and be very careful of how you handle uh, the plants and the animals that you come across. Um, sensitive species like amphibians, salamanders, and frogs might be better for you to just leave alone um, because amphibians have very thin skin. In particular, frogs don't have that keratinized skin that I was talking about in the case of toads. Uh, a frog skin is even thinner than a toad skin. And they will actually breathe through their skin. So their skin is quite a delicate organ. And so if you are, are filled with moisturizer, sunscreen, bug spray on your hands, and you touch that frog or salamander or other amphibian, unfortunately, um, all those chemicals are going to seep right into their lungs. And that's pretty bad for them. So. If you're going to handle a sensitive species, make sure you know how to do so safely for the animal and for yourself. And always be sure to be respectful of the environment, the animals, the plants, everything that you're coming across. So the way you can do a pond study, I'll play this little video. So here I am at Victoria Woods. I have my dip net and I'm just going to swoosh around into the water, pick up some debris uh, that's in there. And I'm going to transfer that little dip net filled of various debris into my buckets of water. And the reason why I'm going for that leaf litter is because a lot of invertebrates, a lot of animals will use that leaf litter as kind of shelter to hide underneath. Um, and so that's a quick, easy 
showcasing of how you collect samples for a pond study. And what I've actually done now is uh, I've actually set up a little bit of a pond study indoors. So what I'll do is I'm going to stop sharing this video. And I'm going to start sharing video from my phone. Bear with me for just one second. Laura, are you able to see the video from my phone? No, I'm not seeing it right now. It's um, hang on. Can we pin this post spotlight for everyone? Oh, excellent! Thank you. So here I have two buckets of water, and so often when I do a pond study, people laugh at me because this is what my bucket usually looks like. It's very messy. It has a lot of leaf litter, um, and what you can do, and what I've done to kind of help us out because online showcasing of pond studies aren't ideal to begin with, is I have my messy bucket filled with all the leaf litter, um, maybe some invertebrates are still crawling around here. And I have a second bucket that is kind of my clean presentation bucket uh, that I'll be using to showcase. I've picked out some of the invertebrates that I saw uh, roaming around the first bucket. And so you guys can let me know if it's maybe very unclear, not focused, but we can see if we take a moment to check out this bucket. Initially, it might seem like there's nothing going on, but we take a moment and we start seeing all the little uh, invertebrates moving around, zipping around. And so this bucket actually has a few animals that I think we'll go through. And the first one, we actually didn't even talk about. So you can see him, he's zipping around. Hopefully that's well in focus for you guys. That is a water flea. So I didn't even touch, uh, touch on water fleas in my presentation, but I happened to catch one, which is pretty cool. And water fleas are very common in aquatic habitats. You can find them in, in many aquatic habitats, but what's kind of really special about water fleas is their ability to absorb oxygen through their skin. And so what that means is they're able to live in water systems that are less oxygenated, but also water systems that are more polluted uh, because they're able to absorb oxygen so easily. If we can take a closer look at, ha, huh, I lost him. Okay, well, I'll see if I can find what I was looking for later, but zipping around, it looks a whole lot like the water fleet, but it's not red. He's just in the corner. Hopefully you guys can see him. Does anybody know what animal that is? Uh, we did go on, we did touch on him. So you should know what he is. I'll give you a hint. He is a predator. Maybe people aren't quite sure. This is a predaceous diving beetle. And so I know it's a little bit tricky uh, for me to test your ID skills. Uh, in this format because things maybe aren't quite as clear as they could be in real life. But I still think doing virtual pond studies are kind of fun. Ooh, I found what I was looking for originally. So I don't know if you can see him, but you may have caught some movement of a little water strider skating around the top of the water. So whenever he moves around, you can see just how well they use the surface tension of the water to move around. And we also have, have a lot of snails. It wasn't, I'll be honest with you guys, you can usually catch a lot more invertebrates, uh, but the water level being so low, it was a bit thundery outside. I didn't catch too many things, but I didn't catch a lot of snails. And snails are really cool because they are actually a bio indicator of good water quality. Um, so if the water isn't very ideal. Uh, snails wouldn't be able to survive. They're, they're sensitive to polluted and, and poor water. And so seeing snails is always pretty exciting. These next two invertebrates I have are really small to see. So I actually separated them into a little vial. Hopefully it focuses and you can make it out. But you're very familiar 
you guys are all probably very familiar with the adult stage of this uh, invertebrate. These two little guys, you can just see on the top right corner, uh, these guys are uh, mosquito larvae. So these guys are the juvenile life stage of mosquitoes. So in maybe a few days, a week, a little bit more, uh, these guys will should grow up to mosquitoes buzzing around the air. And of course, we may not love the mosquitoes uh, bite and make us itchy, but we do appreciate how important they are for aquatic systems. In this other bucket, I just caught a glimpse. Hopefully it focuses and you guys can see it. Of a little blood worm. Let's see if I can get it to wiggle. Just right there. Kind of moved a little bit. Oh, there he goes. So that's a little blood worm. He's quite little. He's a little bit hard to make out. I'm hoping it's focusing well and you guys can get a good look of that little blood worm. So this, uh, both buckets really, uh, they may not look like a lot at first glimpse, but if you take your time with a pond study and you really uh, root through all the leaf litter, you can find some pretty amazing species. And the last uh, species I'm gonna show off to you guys, I was quite proud to catch him. I caught a little handsome frog. So this here is a green frog. And to catch him, I had to make sure that I wasn't wearing any bug spray when I went out. So, you know, it, it took a lot to catch him really, all those bug bites, but He's quite pretty, he's a very dapper fellow. So I'm quite happy that I was able to catch him. And he has his own little bucket uh, so he can kind of be more comfortable while I do this presentation. So these are just some examples of the amazing critters that you can find in aquatic systems near you. Whether you come to the Arboretum and you check out our aquatic habitats, any of the ponds or creeks that I've showcased to you guys, or you check out maybe your neighborhood stream, uh, you can find a lot of these uh, critters in your neighborhoods. And animals like frogs, I love finding them because they're very, very cute, but they are also another great example of a bio indicator of good water quality. Since their skin is so thin and they absorb pollutants and toxins so easily through their skin, if the water quality is bad. Uh, frogs and toads, other amphibians just cannot survive. Uh, so this is an excellent thing to see if you ever find a frog in your neighborhood stream or aquatic system. It means you have a pretty healthy water system, which is always lovely to find out. That's one of the, the many cool things of doing uh, pond studies. Not only are you able to consider and, and think about the, the animals that live in your aquatic systems a little bit more deeply, especially if you're considering the conditions they live in, what habitats they prefer, the adaptations they have. But in finding some of these species, you can actually find out if the water nearby you is, is good quality water. And that's always really exciting to find out. So I'll stop the, the video on this phone because we've gone through all of the little invertebrates that I can see that I think are cool to share. Uh, actually, Look at that. There's actually a little tadpole. So I don't know if you guys can see it, but just beside the little plants on the left, he's not moving anymore. But that is a tadpole. I had no idea he was in there. That's, that's very exciting to find. So that little tadpole will grow up and become a frog. So awesome stuff. If we sat here for an hour, we would continue to find uh, new critters roaming around this water because aquatic systems are so diverse. Um, they have, there's a huge source of biodiversity. So even though these buckets of water don't look like much, there's a lot living in them. And now that we've considered and we've talked about all of the amazing um, animals and plants that uh, live in aquatic systems, let's also consider why it's, uh, how we can conserve them. So I'll start up my sharing again. So aquatic systems are beautiful. They're a huge source of biodiversity. 
I'm hoping that you guys are all now super excited to go out and look for the various animals and plants that you might find in aquatic habitats near you. Uh, but let's take a moment to consider how we might conserve them and uh, do a better job of, of keeping them healthy. And so there's so many ways you can have a positive impact on aquatic systems near you. And it can be as simple as not littering or telling other people not to litter. Um, you know, share it with your friends and your family. Uh, little things like that go a long ways, especially things like plastic litter, unfortunately, often resemble food for a lot of animals. Um, so even though it's no good for them, a lot of them might be very interested in plastic litter because it kind of looks yummy. Other things like considering the products you use in your everyday life. So you're not washing your car in your driveway because a lot of the soap and other chemicals that you're using in your car wash will drain into storm drains that might drain into your local pond or creek. Uh, reducing your water use is an excellent way to have a positive impact on water systems. And that's because by using less water, you're using fewer resources um, to get access to water. And so that helps not only minimize the energy, but also the pollutants that are uh, exerted by the whole system of filtering and getting water to you. And there's a lot of neat ways you can reduce your water use, especially in the garden. So a lot of people are starting to grow rain gardens, uh, which are plants that will help uh, minimize flooding and, and will utilize rainwater more. But you can also set up rain barrels in your backyard and that will help catch uh, rainwater. And then you can use that to water your lawn or your garden instead of having to turn on uh, your hose and use the city water and the city tap. Uh, so there's so many things you can do that are quite easy in your everyday life to help water systems near you. But really at the end of the day, doing something like attending a presentation tonight is, is a really big deal because educating, at least I would have to say my unbiased opinion as someone who educates people, is a really powerful way to make a difference in the world. So by taking the time out of your evening to uh, learn about different aquatic habitats, the animals and the plants that reside in them, and maybe a couple things that you might be able to do to help out water systems, it goes a long way because knowledge is so, so important. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any ideas on ways that you can help conserve water systems. Feel free to pop them in the chat, unmute yourself. Uh, we can definitely discuss them, but I think I'll move it on to questions. So does anyone have any questions from tonight's presentation? So I don't see any questions and I will keep my finger, fingers crossed and hope that means that I've explained everything really, really well. Um, so uh, I don't have anything else left to say. So if we're looking like we don't have any questions, uh, maybe I'll turn it over to Laura and see if she has anything to add. Yeah, I can close things off. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that really wonderful presentation and your enthusiasm and passion and knowledge for all of this really shines through and I learned so much and I'm really excited to go explore the Arboretum again with my little ones and, and do a pond study ourselves and see if we can ID some of those little critters that we learned all about. Um, thank you to all of our participants for joining and to the Arboretum for hosting this event. And I really would like to encourage everyone to also check out some of the other two rivers events that are coming up. I know um, Nature Guelph is hosting one tomorrow. Um, they're hosting it themselves. It's uh, all about owls. If you're interested in learning more about different types of biodiversity. And thank you everyone for joining. I hope you all have a great evening and take some time to go out and enjoy our ponds and use some of Michelle's great tips for protecting our water systems. Have a good awesome. night, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Laura, for helping facilitate tonight's workshop. And, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Take care.